Hello and welcome everyone to another installment of the Intentional Success Webinar Series. Um, I'm your host, Tom Stimson, and today we're going to talk about job costing, and, and um, I'm probably going to have a really good time doing it. So thanks as always for being here, and uh, um, if you're new and there's always new people here, um, happy to have you. Um, I am Tom Stimson. I'm president of the Stimson Group. I'm a business consultant. I work exclusively with the owners and management teams in, in the live events industry. I don't really consult in any other industries at all. Um, probably because I've been in this industry for 40 years. This is what I know. This is where I'm comfortable and where I can deliver the most value. Um, this is being recorded as you just heard. Um, and I always check about this time to make sure that isn't true. Yeah, this is this looks like it's really going. And it'll be accessible later on um, today. And you will get an email notifying you of where to view it. Um, it's also always available on the Intentional Success Network, uh, which I'll talk more about later. Questions, please use the Q&A box for questions. It helps me identify the questions, um, even though sometimes I will see them in chat as well. Um, say hello to everybody in the chat, let them know where you're from and what's on your mind today. And uh, I hope you all get to know each other and, and do some business together. So, Job cost. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about two aspects of job costing here because what's important to me is the step that I think we all skip. And well, fact of the matter is a lot of people skip job costing reviews, looking backwards on numbers, which is what job costing is all about. And I want to talk also about job costing looking forward. In other words, forecasting, which I think is far more valuable and far more helpful in this. And the reason this is coming up the reason I want to talk about this is that lots of things have obviously changed here recently, right? Um, more and more, you know, if you take the, you know, 20 years ago, I started about talking about writing proposals differently and presenting scopes of work as sort of line item pricing and things like that. And more and more of you do that, which means that the line between what we show our customer and what we measure financially in terms of what it took to do the job is getting blurrier and blurrier. So it's getting harder to, for us to understand what it is that the customer is paying for compared to what it's actually going to cost us because we've changed our conversation a little bit. Um, I'm having this conversation now with you because I'm finding more and more that we are selling things below cost, but we are tricking ourselves into thinking we're making money by doing it. For instance, if I pass something through or mark it up 10%, the fact of the matter is I'm losing money right? Because I'm going to make less than what it paid, what I'm going to have to pay to get that through. And the fact that we don't understand that makes this topic even more timely and important. We're also having this conversation now because uh, there's a, a lot of concern about losing customers as you start to address the changes in the marketplace in terms of what labor costs and trucking, equipment's gone up, and you're getting resistance from your customers who want to see numbers the way they're used to. They want to see smaller numbers, of course. Um, and we're very afraid of losing those customers. So we're resisting sharing with them the information that they need to budget their jobs correctly. But often the people that we're working the hardest for are the customers that are the least profitable. So your post job cost reporting would be very helpful for you to have a better understanding of which one of your customers, um, which ones of your customers need a little bit of extra effort, sales effort to get them over that hump. And then the last point, and I make this every time I talk on this topic is that cost accounting, which is what job costing is, is not the same as financial accounting. We are not creating a profit and loss statement. We are not applying overhead. Financial accounting is primarily there to record your numbers so that you can pay taxes and also maybe see how your business was doing so that you can pay taxes. Um, cost accounting is, out, is about understanding the economic value of the things that you do inside of the organization when you're delivering a product or service or manufacturing something. So again, we need to work on these distinctions and understand them so that we can do a better job of applying the tools that are in front of us to reap the benefit, okay? Now, the benefit is, is there's a lot of margin out there that's being left on the table because we're not forecasting it correctly. 
which starts with us not looking backwards correctly to understanding what things actually cost us, which when we do that often is a big wake up call when we start to understand what our numbers are really telling us. So job cost by definition is a look backwards, right? If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna run a job cost analysis on a job, I'm technically looking backwards to see what happened. It's a measurement of all the direct costs that were incurred to execute the project, plus indirect costs that were applied in order to execute the project. So if you have an indirect or an overhead cost that wouldn't be there if you didn't ever sell anything, then it's an indirect cost of goods sold that we need to apply to jobs. Now, we know that it's labor plus materials, plus some sort of overhead that we apply to a job. It's the labor used, right? It's the materials that we applied, including the waste. So if we bought something and we used part of it, but we bought the whole thing, we charge the whole thing to the job, right? I, if I'm building something, I don't charge for part of a sheet of plywood. I had to buy the entire sheet of plywood. I use as much of the plywood as I can, but I don't use as waste, but I still have to charge it to the job. Uh, we have a lot of applied materials with waste in our industry, but we don't think of them because we are not plywood and we are not selling and renting plywood. We have people, we have tech, uh, tech, high tech equipment, but there's a lot of waste in those numbers, okay? And then the overhead portion of this is all the non-sales resources that are needed because you sold a project, right? So that indirect cost, we need to put that in there as well. So these are some of the things that we miss. For instance, right? If I'm looking backwards, if I'm looking at somebody's job cost re report, typically all I'm seeing is revenue, net revenue, by the way, net revenue minus outside labor, outside sub rentals. Maybe we bought something specific that we costed to the show. Maybe we captured some credit card expenses that we put to the show. And maybe we use some inside labor that I'm charging a different rate for than I charge for the outside labor, but very often we're not seeing that number. So what's missing from these job costs is number one, discounts in all of their forms. Because our job costs that we do now, that many people do now, is looking at your net revenue number, which is after discount. So we're looking at the profitability of a job based on what we sold it for, not what it was actually worth, which was the retail price. So anything that gets us from a retail price to a price as sold is a discount, whether it is a discount percentage on equipment, whether it's I didn't charge them for some equipment, whether I charge them a one day for a week instead of two or three days or whatever it might be. If I change the price on something, that's a discount. All of those things are discount. And they are a cost against that job that we need to understand. Okay? Um, anytime I have to sub rent something and I spend more than I charged for it, that's a signal that I need to fix my pricing. Okay, So if I'm doing a job cost review, I need to look at everything I'm upside down on. Even if I'm only upside down by breaking even, that's still upside down. Um, fair share of the actual equipment used. Imagine you sold a show and then you let your technicians prep it and they just take whatever's on the shelf to do with what they want to on the show. All of that is a discount, but it's also waste. So we took equipment and, and applied the waste from multiple jobs and put it on this job. And we're not capturing that because it has value. Um, employee time use, we're not getting a fair value. We're getting guesstimates on project management time. Uh, planning pre-production time. We're just guessing at a lot of this stuff. So we're not recording actual time. So we're missing an important component of job costing. Um, handling costs. If you, if you do something on behalf of the client to help them out, um, there are handling costs for doing that, not just for the administration cost of buying something and like, like an airline ticket, um, not just the cost of the airline ticket, the cost of the person to buy the airline ticket, plus the cost of holding that money. In other words, being the customer's bank, all of these things have value. Whether you charge the client for them or not is irrelevant. 
we need to charge the job for, otherwise we don't have a clear understanding of what's going on. So having set that up, um, we have a good understanding of that we need to look backwards on job costs. We need to improve ourselves, but that's really not what this webinar is about. Okay, What this webinar is really about is that step that matters most. Okay, Job costs look backwards. We need a job cost forecast that looks forward. In other words, I need to predict the value of any job when I write the order before I ever give numbers to the customer. And while many of you are saying, well, Tom, that's really impossible. That's not how it works. We don't know what our costs are going to be. I'm going to argue that, yes, in fact, for the purposes that job cost forecasting fulfills JCF, you can do this. It is not that difficult. And you already have the data to do it with most of the time. The other benefit of this is that if you master job cost forecasting, you're going to carry a lot less about job cost because job cost will take care of itself if you sold things correctly. Now, we still want to check job cost. We want to spot check things. We want to make sure we're following protocols. We want to make sure that we don't need to update pricing. But in job cost forecasting, you're always paying attention to what your cost is. Therefore, you're updating pricing when you put the quote together. So it reduces the dependence on backwards old data, mistakes that you've already made, to tell you that you need to do something differently. Okay. So mastering this is really the key for my clients in terms of uh, managing the scalability of their business, which will be next month's webinar, by the way. Um, and we need to do this forecast now. It's more important than ever for many good reasons. Number one is you haven't sent the client numbers yet. <laughs> In other words, you don't have to backpedal on anything. The rush to get a quote out to customers is endemic. I see it all the time. I see it in all of my clients. We try and tap the brakes. Guys, slow down. Don't slow down so much that it takes you five days to get a quote out. Slow down enough that you can re review your proposal, validate that you're using real costs and applying appropriate margins, and then packaging it in a way that's appropriate for that customer. So looking at your job cost forecast, before you send the quote to the client, it's gonna make a huge difference in your business in terms of profitability and what jobs you're willing to invest discount into because discount is an investment in future business. Okay, Then you will learn what things are worth and that's exciting. Um, sometimes we don't think things are worth what they really are, right? But yet the price is, $10,000. We don't think it's worth $10,000. Trucking, for instance. The fact is, your feelings about cost don't matter in job cost forecasting. All that matters is I have a cost, I need to apply an appropriate margin to it, and then I need to package it for the customer to sell it the right way. It'll help you solidify your scope of work. We've got to get rid of a lot of the fuzziness if we're looking at a forecast, because again, I need costs and we don't know how we're going to do that yet, doesn't generate a very credible cost basis for the job. Um, and pulling back a little bit, it equalizes all the jobs that you're looking at. So if you run every job through the JCF formula format, you will have a, everything will be weighed on equal footing. You can compare clients on an equal basis. You can compare jobs on an equal basis. You can compare time periods on an equal basis because all jobs are measured for profitability the exact same way. There are no shenanigans to try and make the numbers work for the customer that messes up our insight into our cost basis and our potential profitability. Okay. And the big thing here is that it removes, mo it doesn't remove all, but it removes most of the emotion of pricing. Okay. It takes away the power of somebody to put their emotion into the pricing model without checks and balances. And there's a lot of emotion in pricing as, we're, as we'll see as we walk through some of the things I'm gonna show you today. So reducing that emotion and being more logical about pricing, is gonna make a huge impact to your bottom line and the quality of customers that you're getting. Now, some of the principles, the backbones of job cost forecasting uh, for you old people, job cost analysis, it's the same thing, JCA, JCF, JCF just seems to be named better. Um, that's one of the little improvements for getting this time around. 
One of the backbones is intentional pricing. Okay, everybody is working from the same cost and margin formula. The value of a video projector for this customer is exactly the same as it is for this customer in terms of your economic cost of putting it on the job. So they should work from the same cost basis and the same margin expectations, but it's okay to have different margin expectations between clients, but for two clients that are equal, their pricing is gonna come out very, very similar. So intentional pricing, if you have retail prices in your system, those prices have to come from somewhere. I know where they came from, you made them up, okay? But they deserve more attention than that. And there are plenty of methods for doing that. Intentional discounting. We, as much as I've been preaching this over the years, and I know some of you have tried, the fact is you have too many data points that you can alter when you're putting a quote together that will affect the price. You can change the line item price. You can omit a line item, just leave it off there and then send it anyway. You can change the multiplier. You can change the discount. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Basically, it means our prices are completely fluid, right? And that's what we're telling our clients. Our price can be anything you want it to be. I'll just move some stuff around and we're good. You can sign the contract, right? But the fact is you're making big moves with your gross profit when you do these things. And the opportunity cost of using assets um, for tying up for, for days or even weeks, right? So any reduction in a price is a discount. I'm not against discounting. I just want to be intentional about doing it. We need to know what the actual discount is because a lot of your preconceived notions about what things should be priced are completely offset by your preconceived notions of what's an acceptable discount in whatever situation. So we have to reconcile those two things. And then target margins. I very rarely find people who have true target margins when they're putting together a quote. What they look at is their expected outside costs, and maybe how busy they are to get a feeling, which is an emotion, about whether this job is going to be profitable. There's also a lot of feelings that go into what's an acceptable margin. The bigger the job, the smaller margins you seem to be willing to accept to the point where doing four $50,000 jobs will yield you more gross profit than doing one $200,000 job. The difference between those two scenarios is emotion and a lack of reviewing your numbers and having a target margin. So we need to have target, target margins. The fourth thing in this is that we talk about margins. We don't talk about markup. And I'm gonna remind you again why this is important. Here's a simple chart. You can Google it and find it for yourself and print it out. The difference between markup and margin is huge. If I take an item that costs me $100 and I mark it up 25%, I'm going to charge $125, right? Now I'm going to make 20% margin on a 25% markup. So if your target margin, as many of you tell me, is 30%, then you need to be marking things up 43%. Oh no, the customer won't pay for that. Yeah, right? No, it's you, it's in your head, it's your mindset that's keeping you from accepting that because you've convinced yourself that markup is what's important. I like to say that markup is an emotional equation. Creating margin is a rational one. I want you to use rational pricing, right? Pull some of the emotion out. So if you mark up 25% and you only get 20% gross profit, 20% is awful, by the way. Did you know that? Would you take 20% on your entire job? Why would you take 20% on something that you have to outsource that you don't have available? Why would you accept a lower margin than you would for the rest of the job? It's a question you need to answer for yourselves. All right. Let's, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet here in a minute, and that's going to be most of what the webinar is, but I want to talk about the day in the life of a job cost forecasting environment. <clears throat> Slow your process down. Get the right steps in there. Don't rush to put a quote together, right? You have a discovery call with the client that uncovers their needs and wants. You focus on what their budget is, not what your price will be, because in, when we get down to negotiating, we're going to, we're going to negotiate budget and scope, not price, Right. We're going to manage the scope at this point, not the margin, because I don't want my margins are not negotiable. 
For instance, if you've determined internally that you're going to intentionally target a minimum gross profit of 30% JCF on every job, there's nothing to discuss here with the client, right? We're not going to negotiate margin, okay? We are going to talk about your budget and what scope of work that budget is will buy you. Pricing is cost plus margin. So you have to know what things cost. And knowing what things cost takes time. It takes effort. It's a little bit of a skill that you have to learn how to do. There are some people who are good at it, and there's some people who are not. So getting the cost of things becomes a core competency of your organization, okay? Including your internal resources. Internal resources have a cost, okay? The epiphany about all of this is that the cost of the equipment that's sitting on your shelf in a job cost forecast methodology is the same as the cost of the equipment that you had to sub rent because it's the opportunity cost or the replacement cost of that equipment, all right? So all of a sudden, all the numbers start to fall into place because there aren't as many variables as you thought they would be, okay? So we know what things cost. We know what our margins need to be. We create a budget and we create a scope of work or, you know, we develop the budget so that we know what the price of the scope of work is. We massage it till we get to the client's budget. We remove scope or we add or put in more scope if we can afford it. And then we negotiate with the customer on their budget, not your price. It would take me several other webinars to talk about how to actually do that, okay? but we need to quit negotiating price. Well, hey, I see you've got everything covered in the quote. That's exactly what we talked about. Man, I just need to get the price stamp. Okay. Well, you know, I could do this, I could do this. No, what you can do is you can take something out of the scope. And so you come back to them and say, hey, look, this little extra piece here, you guys thought it would be fun. It's a cute little piece of shtick. But right now, that's the piece of your budget that I would recommend not spending if you don't have the budget for it. This is the thing I would cut. And here's how it will affect your overall um, budget for the job. So if you have a lower budget, but the fact is they don't have a lower budget. They're just asking for a lower price because everybody asks for a lower price. It's their job. Yes. So do you want to take something out of the job? No, not really. Okay, great. So your budget is this. <laughs> Okay, now we can move forward. So it's a very different way of negotiating, but it is honest about what things actually cost. And because you have paid attention to what things, what margin you need to make, you know where to draw a line in the sand. All right, I'm gonna pull over here into, let me switch my sharing and go to another share here. And um, yeah, I know there's a faster way of doing that. And I didn't choose that way. I'm sure I'll get emails. All right. Um, keep the, uh, if you have questions, feel free to post them at any time. There's, there's no reason to wait. Just put them all in there. And uh, we'll go to the chat, q and is there. Good. All right. What I'm going to show you is a, a template that I made. You're going to get a link to this so that you can open this up, make a copy of it, play with it, do whatever you want, or you can ignore it, or maybe you've got a better version. That's all fine but I needed to have something to talk about. So I wanna give you a tool that will at least help you understand the concepts, right? So here's the empty version of it. You know, you can put some things in here. You're gonna pull some numbers and things right out of your rental management software. So if you build a quote in Flex or Intellivent or R2 or Higher Track, do that, okay? But if you wanna analyze the numbers from a forecast standpoint, to see where you can make some movement to fit the budget or meet the criteria for the channel or whatever it might be. If you wanna understand whether or not you're making money, here's a quick way of doing it. Now, I will also tell you, most of those systems have a way of doing it themselves, but if you don't know how to do it analog, doing it digitally is gonna be a non-starter. So here's your analog version of this. So you're gonna come in, I always start with labor, right? Because we start a quote with labor because again, it takes a lot of the emotion out of it because um, I know I'm gonna need people. I need audio, video, lighting. I need two audio, two video, two lighting. You know, I need a head rigger. I need stage hands. I need a truck. Oh, then, then we need to figure out what the gear is, right? Don't shortchange the labor, put the labor in there to begin with and you'll be better off. So we're gonna take some big categories for labor. 
we'll be able to look at, ignore the errors, we're going to be able to look at the JCF version, the projected cost based on some numbers that we're going to set in the spreadsheet. And then later for your financial accountant to come back and put in actual costs and see what your traditional job cost is, which will help you have a better understanding of the relationship between JCF and actual during different periods of time. Because obviously when you're super busy, your costs are going to vary. Um, how well you execute is going to vary. And your job cost forecast is always going to be more pessimistic than actual, except when it's not, in which case we need to have a meeting about it, right? So you'll see all of this in action here in just a minute. But we get you to both versions of this. And then we've got some other reports on there if you're doing commissions and things like that. Now, I told you there's some settings in here. Um, you know, the cost factor of equipment is for the equipment that you own, how much are you going to charge the job for using that equipment? That is a percentage of retail price, which, oh, by the way, retail price has to be figured out based on cost, which is replacement cost. Done webinars on that as well. Labor, what's the cost factor for labor that we're going to use? Um, what's the cost factor for the other things that you're going to use? What's the floor margin that you expect to make to consider a job. In other words, sales has to at least get to this margin before they bring you anything. And then we're gonna get another 10 points out of it after reviewing it. If you have a sales commission, we can put some things in there. I'll show you how that works. My point is there's some numbers there that we can change from a management side. I put a margin calculator in here because when, you know, we have to know what things cost, right? So say for instance, I need to go run a nine by 27 rear screen because I don't have one. Okay, um, my sub rental price is $650. We're discounting the customer 30%. I got to charge $928 to break even. Do not break even, okay? You expect to make a 30 point margin on this based on this table setting that we've made over here, which means your retail price needs to be $1,300. And now you can discount it and still make some money. It's the equivalent of 100% markup, which is why you hear me all the time say, take your wholesale price, double it. That's your retail price. Now you can discount it. And for those of you who say, well, Tom, we don't discount things that we're sub renting. Great, then do that, <laughs> okay? And you can now come up with a retail price that's undiscounted um, if you want to, but goodness gracious, um, why not charge more? Because the client doesn't know and they don't care, right? So this is information for you and all the blended, you know, the, 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 the retail price on this 9 by 20, 27 screen is not going to make or break this deal, right? So it's best that we actually know what things are worth. Now, I'll wander into uh, the example here. So I've, I've, I've written an order and I've pulled the numbers out of it so that you can kind of see how this works, right? Um, again, we always start with labor. Um, we need to estimate our pre-production cost. We may come back later and find out that we are really good at estimating or really bad at estimating. Um, but there's no reason that pre-production cannot be a profit center as we learned during the pandemic. Um, um, On-site technical director, project manager, you know, show director, show caller, stage manager, whatever you call that person, your show crew rates, the amount of overtime that you're estimating, travel days, local cam ops, stage hands, big numbers, big fat numbers that you can drop in here and find out that what we have here is a job that is 36%, 37 labor is 37% of retail, almost 40% of invoice, which is pretty normal for our industry. Um, it's not the best, it's not the worst, um, but for a typical, you know, working with agencies or end clients, it's a pretty, pretty standard number. Now, what the JCF model does is it uses your cost basis assumptions and applies it to your pre-job cost or to your proposal price to get you to what your pre-job cost number is. So on this job where we're charging $116,000 retail for pricing, and I have about $82,000 in JCF, okay? About a 30% margin, 70% cost, again, this was all set up in the management tables, right? You know, what is, what is my expectation on my cost factor? There it is, 65%. Um, so we're getting some numbers. Now, sometimes 
when we're having to make up numbers, we don't always do a great job of it. For instance, right here on cam ops, you know, if my cost is at 65%, um, I'm not making a lot of money here on the camera operators because I'm putting a quoted price in here. So if I have a quoted cost, I can use that. If I don't have a quoted cost and I'm using the house costs, I've got a formula for that. So all of that gets dropped in here for all of our categories. So as we walk through here, you know, you can do the math in here or you can do the math in your other in your rental management software to come up with these numbers here. And we find out that, yeah, you know, here's, you know, I've got almost 10% of invoice price against this job. It's just for travel. Travel's gone up, hasn't it, right? Um, then we get down to your rental equipment, okay? So stock rental equipment are the things that you would normally carry, right? It's the stuff that's generally already priced in your system. It's not the specialty items that you know you always have to go out for and you always have to go get a price for. It's the prices that you have built in. In my uh, management table, I'd set up a 40% cost factor. So I'm going to charge the job 40% of the retail price for this job. So I've got a fixed cost here. These other things I had to go out and I got quoted prices. I got a quoted price on a stage deck for 3000 bucks and I only put 4000 bucks in the proposal. Oh, that's going to be an uncomfortable conversation, isn't it? Um, same thing with, you know, breakout rooms. I'm subbing out the breakout rooms and, you know, only making a small margin on that. Um, I mean, even worse margins on the industrial equipment. Oh, actually, no, the margins have improved here. Hey, somebody updated this. This is great. Good for you. Pat on the head. We're, you know, we're doubling up prices. That's good. And then trucking, always going to be a sore point, right? So now I've got a job that has a retail value of $316,000. And I want to give them a 25% discount off the equipment, which is specifically that owned equipment number, $75,000 that we have. So I've got an 18, almost $19,000 discount on this job. That's got the job below $300,000, which made someone happy, right? And now I can see what my projected gross profit is. Well, based on my JCF, I've got a projected gross profit on this job of about 31%. Well, Assuming that my floor is 30%, this is, this is, I mean, we're cut to the quick. I have no more room to discount. I don't have a lot of wiggle room here at all because I need that 30% for this job to be worth doing compared to other jobs that I might want to do. Because again, you've got demand that's exceeding your capacity. So we have a right to be really picky about which jobs we actually do. So this is a quick way, you know, this is one big step up from a napkin valuation of a job in the forecast method. Um, and again, you can do this in your rental management software if you have it set up correctly. But now I can take a pretty substantial quote and in just a matter of minutes, put this all together and have really good analysis on it. And then when the job is over, I can come back and put in actual costs in to see how well the company performed. I'm making this distinction because job cost forecasting assumes that all jobs are equally burdened with overhead and market rates. Actual costs mean that I got to use some internal resources, which were probably less expensive if I own the equipment and I'm only charging the job 40% for it. You know, I'm making some money here, right? So if I'm using in house labor, um, if I negotiate better on my labor numbers, I'm going to get some better pricing here. So this will reflect the reality of how well the company did. The results of the actual job cost are not a byproduct of the job. They are a byproduct of the organization. Okay? Sales delivers revenue. Operations delivers gross profit. Okay? They need each other to do this. Significant gross profit is delivered from significant sales organizations that really know how to sell and operations that really know how to manage costs, times, expenses, and planning, all of which will give you a much better bottom line. So I can look at this job and say, hey, there's a bunch of things here that we did really well on. Oh, here's one we didn't. My cost exceeded my revenue. Over time, what happened here? Oh, I don't know. I guess we had overtime and we didn't tell the salesperson and we didn't charge the customer for it. 
because we are still afraid of the customer like it was 2019 where they're coming back to the customer and said hey you know that rehearsal you guys came back and decided to do after you'd been drinking at the restaurant for three hours yeah that was an overtime right so it tells us when we're not capturing the things that we should be capturing um it also tells us when we did good on stuff right you know it's like hey you know um we did good on the scissors lift. It was only uh, $3,600 instead of the $4,000 that we thought it was going to be. So we can get an initial price on something and then go negotiate a better deal when it's actually time to cut the purchase order and pull the trigger, All right? So this job in true job cost actually did a lot better. We have to take that discount out of there. And then all of a sudden we're at 40% gross profit. This is a pretty respectable job as delivered. Um, but it may not compare well to other jobs, but we won't know until we do the post job cost report. Um, for another job sold exactly the same, the projected gross profit would probably be the same, but depending on the day of the week it started, the timing of things, the overlap of jobs, that truck that didn't get back in time, that may affect this number over here, right? So the job didn't generate the extra gross profit here, it was the circumstances and the response of the team that actually did that. So scrolling down in this template, um, we um, another big difference in, in, in JCF is that we always measure profitability and ratios against the retail, not against the net. Um, the, once you play with it a little bit, you'll realize why that makes way more sense. Um, if I take a $100,000 job that is $50,000 worth of equipment on it, and I give the client a 50% discount on the equipment, now the job is $75,000, I can make that job look really profitable, but I'm not taking into account the $25,000 I paid to get the job, as opposed to another client who might have paid us $90,000, right? So we, we have to pay attention to what the retail price is. Getting $75,000 on a $100,000 job may not be the end of the world, okay? but we're not gonna pat somebody on the back for getting 80% gross profit on a job where we could have had 90% gross profit. So, um, so if you've got, um, so we put the gross profit that we generated here, it's 30% of the retail price. Our floor is 30% on that. If I have a commission on gross profit, I'm gonna generally set that commission to be above the floor. So a percentage of the uh, gross profit above the floor. So this job only had $2,500 above the floor. So the sales commission is pretty low. I also have a sales bonus, which is based on top line revenue, okay? In which case they do a little bit better. So uh, we can sell a job at, you know, barely making money, you know, hitting just above my floor, and the salesperson is not wasting their time because they are still gonna earn a commission based on the revenue that you approved. So again, the job is going to deliver you a bunch of cash. It's going to deliver you gross profit and cash. It still has value, but we are setting standards. All right. So that's the gist of the model. That's something that you can play with um, and look at your numbers, but if nothing else, I want you to start the conversation in your organization about paying more attention to what things actually cost. Now I'm gonna stop the share. Let me pop back over to the slides and talk about a few more things. And PowerPoint, there we go. Okay. So, is that where I wanted to be? It could well be where I wanted to be. All right, uh, let me go back up here a couple of slides. I could skip something here. All right, so we looked at the JCF template. Um, I want to answer this question about overhead. Matter of fact, somebody asked about overhead and I knew you were going to ask about overhead. So I went ahead and prepared a question about overhead. Um, look, in this model capturing overhead, well, you don't do it. <laughs> we're, we're not in manufacturing. Overhead does not apply here. What you need to think of is gross profit from jobs is positive cash flow, okay? Overhead is a fixed expense. You're going to spend it regardless. How much cash flow is this job going to generate? Because gross profit is what pays for overhead. Gross profit in, in excess of overhead is net profit. 
In manufacturing, if we're doing cost accounting for manufacturing or doing managerial accounting, we do figure in overhead factors in there because we're looking at the total investment of the business into manufacturing. It's not practical in a service business like ours, right? We capture overhead in the costs that we built in to the model, such as the 40% 40 40 that we charge for the equipment. So assigning burden, which is another way of calculating overhead to a project, it's just another way of lowering the expected gross profit. So if you want to figure in overhead cost, raise your expected gross profit by 10%. You just put in overhead cost. It's the same thing. I'd rather you work from real numbers and understand what they are. When I charge the job 40% for the house's equipment, that's based on data. And we'll talk about that um, here in just a minute. Um, what else do I need to tell you about this? Okay. Overhead is covered by reasonable margin expectations. So cost plus margin equals price, right? So since JCF equalizes costs across all jobs, overhead is already spread around. Don't overthink this. Take my word on this. I've been, I've been working this for 10 years, trying to shoot holes in it. It took me 25 years to figure out how to do this. Um, it's, um, overhead is not, a, not our big concern here. You're going to make more money to pay for more overhead. Actually, you're going to make more money to pay for less overhead because you're running your companies more scalably. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here, just, just so you have an idea of what's going on. Um, if I'm running um, projects that are smaller than $50,000, think about your channels. You, have, you probably have three channels. You have some retail customers, you have some resale customers, and you have some B2B customers, Okay. What's the expected target gross profit for those jobs? Again, my floor might be 30, okay? That doesn't mean I wanna sell at 30. If I have a retail client, I wanna sell at 35 to 45% gross profit, okay? If I have an agency client, I might get down to 30 sometimes when it makes sense, but maybe I wanna make 35 or even 40%. If I have a B2B client, I might go below margin because now I'm dealing with wholesale, okay? In which case I'm taking this job for cash flow which may or may not be a good idea for you, but assuming that it is, I'm willing to set something that's below my floor because this is really about capturing some cash flow for some unused assets. Now, if you're doing projects that have like a lot of creative high risk factors or putting big LED walls um, or doing some content or we're shooting videos, um, doing a streaming portion of all that, scenery, full production, lighting design, all those fun things, then my margin expectations change. My margin expectations should actually be higher, even though I'm now talking about jobs that might be 300, 400, 500 thousand dollars. My margin expectations actually need to increase because again, do I want four jobs at fifty thousand dollars making forty points, or do I want John one job at two hundred thousand dollars making twenty five points? You know, do the math. So for bigger creative products, if I'm in retail, I might be targeting 50 or 60% gross profit on those jobs, okay? They're paying for your skill and your intellect and your execution and your planning, your ability to procure, your ability to deliver a guaranteed outcome, right? Um, agency clients need a little bit of room to mark things up. They need, because they still mark up, they don't do margin. So we might be selling to them, you know, 10 or 15 points less than we would a retail customer. And for B2B clients, um, I'm not even going to tell you what the number is because you shouldn't do it. Never take a risk for a B2B client unless they're willing to pay you at least resale pricing, right? Let them take on their own risk. Don't let them shove risk off onto you. So don't take on that extra risk. So summary of what we're looking at here, you know, the principles of job cost analysis, you know, gross profit is measured against retail pricing. Understand what your retail is and what, how you're doing against retail. Remember that um, discounts are a job cost, okay? Retail pricing is always based on replacement cost, what you can reasonably expect to pay if you have to go out of, out of house for it, plus an appropriate amount of margin. Margin is commensurate with risk. The more risk involved, the more margin you need to put on it, right? Margin and markup are not the same thing. Download a table, start using it, pay attention to those things. And discounts, like I said, are always a job cost. And then last but foremost, customers don't get to dictate your profit. 
you get to set your margins. You get to manipulate the scope of work to meet the client's budget. Okay, you need to be in control, not the customer, to how you make money. It's not their business how it's not your business how they make money. It shouldn't be their business how you make money. So if profit with zero risk is worth 10%, okay, or with almost no risk is worth 10%, what is this next job worth? Okay. If somebody says, hey, I want you to take $1,000 and put it in the bank for five years and I'm going to give you 10% a year, do it, right? That's easy money. Easy money. You'd do it for 2.5% right now, right? So think about your job this way. How much risk are you willing to take? Are you willing to risk not getting paid for a million-dollar job, because that's the risk we're taking, for 10% gross profit, 20%? How big does the number need to be before you gamble like that with your business? All right, let's wander into some questions here. Um, here, I can stop sharing the screen. You can look at my ugly face instead. Um, okay, we talked about the overhead thing. Um, okay, um, so what software do people use for this level of job costing? What I just showed you, that's an Excel spreadsheet. You can do it in Google. Um, there's nothing fancy about this at all. The formulas are all very simple. Um, spreadsheets are all you really need to do. Um, at you know, if you're using a product in, like a flex, like a flex or Intellivent or whatever it might be, there are places in their product kit tables for you to put a cost, a cost factor, or a cost amount for the standard items that you have. So if you are charging, you know, if you if you're a uh, replacement cost for a camera operator is $600 a day and you charge a thousand, you put a thousand dollars retail price in there, you put a cost on there for, of $600 or hundred dollars an hour, $60 an hour, however you look at it. And it can generate a pre-job cost report for you. Um, so you've got to set it up correctly to do this, but the capabilities are definitely there. Um, okay. Um, so how do you handle pass-through expenses? Okay, so when you call them pass-through expenses, it kind of tells me what segment of the industry that you're from. For those of you who don't know, pass-through expense is the thing that you don't charge the client for doing. Many people say like airline tickets are a pass-through. We just charge you what the airline charged us, right? Um, you know, maybe meal expenses are a pass-through. Um, sometimes we pass through things we shouldn't pass through, like union labor or trucking um, or other really huge expenses because we're afraid of the client, right? So using trucking as an example, if your cost is $10,000, which is probably what it costs you to get a truck round trip, you know, halfway across the country and back right now, you should be charging the client $20,000. Oh, no, the client won't pay that much. Why should I charge them that much, right? I shouldn't be able to mark it up that much. If you are dealing with resistance from a client, well, let's first deal with the resistance that you're having inside your head. The first sale is always to yourself, right? If you don't believe it's $20,000, look at it this way. If the client won't pay you the $20,000 for trucking and they just want to pay pass-through, I'm going to charge them a handling fee. So I'm going to charge them an admin fee for all the pass-through expenses. And I might be charging them 10, 12, even 15% of the money that I'm handling for them as their buying agent. However, they will assume all of the liability for trucking or the airline ticket or anything else that goes wrong with the thing that you bought on their behalf. So if they want you to take responsibility and absorb the increased cost if there is a problem, Okay, then the price is 20,000 bucks, okay? If the truck is late and it creates overtime, that's gonna be on them if they don't wanna pay you a fair margin for putting that together for them. Make sense? So we assume an awful lot of risk and pass through expenses without being explicit about who's responsible for what happens with the item that you bought. If, if you're passing through airline tickets and the airline cancels your ticket, okay, and you have to buy another ticket, the client needs to pay for that one as well. And you're just going to charge them the management fee on top of that. Okay. So um, 
Next question. How do I know what my JCF rate is for equipment? You used 40% in the thing. Okay. So if my retail price for, you know, a, a camera chain is, is a thousand bucks a day, I don't know what camera chain is a thousand bucks a day, thousand bucks a day. Um, what am I going to charge the job in the JCF format? Well, in the model that I showed you, I had it set up at 40%. So I'm going to charge the job $400. That doesn't mean I can rent that for $400 because it's probably going to cost me five or $600. The number I'm charging the job is going to be less than the wholesale rate because we're using the house's equipment. So we can afford to charge the job a little bit less for that and be a little bit more competitive. The amount that that is, whether it's 30, 35, 40, 45, 50%, will vary depending on the type of business that you're running. Okay. For instance, if your retail prices hover near wholesale prices, right, then you're, you're on the, the end of the value chain where there's not much margin left. So I might have to charge the job 70 or 80% of retail price to get a good forecast out of that because my replacement cost is so close to my retail cost. On the other hand, if you're a company that's selling, you know, big creative extravaganzas and you're not you know, less than 50% of your invoice is actual rental equipment, I'm going to probably, my retail prices are generally going to be much higher than wholesale, probably at least double what the wholesale price is. So I can charge, you know, 40% or maybe even 30% on some items to the job and be very comfortable that if I have to incur a replacement cost, it's going to be blended into all the volume of the work that I do. So it's a fair number for JCF. What you don't want in your JCF rate is a number that makes it more attractive to subrent than to use the house equipment. For instance, if you've got some projectors, maybe they're five years old, salespeople don't want to rent them anymore. They want to have the new sexy thing and they know they can subrent from XYZ wholesale vendor and get a really nice projector, brand new, good deal on that. They may start plugging those numbers in there, in which case they've got to take that cost and apply the appropriate margin to it to get to the number. But now I've got equipment that is perfectly usable, okay, sitting on the shelf. So I'm encouraging bad behavior or non ideal behavior on the sell side. So again, this number takes a little bit of massaging to figure out what's the right number for your organization, but there's some criteria. Uh, well, the question I thought would be first, but turned out to be overhead, was uh, labor prices are all over the map right now, as and we know equipment prices are have gone up as well too. So wholesale equipment prices are up pretty significantly, I think. But labor prices, oh my God, okay? Which prices should we be comparing to? If we are, so what I'm reading this question is, is that if I can go out on the, on the labor market and I can find five different rates for the same job, um, say that camera operator and a camera operator in, in, in Oklahoma City is costing me 500 bucks a day, but in Dallas it's 650, in San Diego it's 700, and Florida it's 450. I mean, which number am I supposed to use, okay? Um, for the type of business that you normally do, you use your replacement cost. If, for instance, you're a regional company that primarily does work in Southern California, you're going to use the, the high number, the San Diego number down there, because that is your replacement cost. If you're a Florida company and you're used to seeing lower camera operator rates, and I don't know if that's true or not, so don't take me at that, but I've got a job that's one time a year that's in San Diego, I need to use the San Diego rate. But if most of my work is regional work, I can use the regional replacement cost. Maybe it's not 450, maybe it's 550, maybe it's 600, but that's the number I would use and I would put margin on top of that. So look at your best, most likely case scenario and use that as your cost basis, but just be aware your cost basis doesn't work everywhere. Right. If your standard stagehand labor rate in your marketplace is, you know, eighty-five dollars an hour, and you're going into Moscone Center, um, having to hire local sixteen and getting some really talented folks, but guess what? Your costs can be a lot higher there. So now you need to make special pricing for that. You know all of this. This is just a reminder 
that we have to take a look at the situations and we're going into an unusual pricing cost situation, we have to come back and adjust our pricing appropriate for that venue. So, all right, I will get this recording uploaded. I'm gonna get the uh, landing page ready to go out later on today. I'm gonna include a link to um, the spreadsheet that I showed you earlier so that you can play, uh, play with it. If you find any egregious errors, let me know. I'll fix them so the next person doesn't have to find them. Um, and it, like I said, I didn't go out and get this vetted by experts on there to make sure that I didn't have any errors in there, but I'm pretty good with spreadsheets. So it's probably 99% correct. But again, if you find a problem, just let me know. I'll get it fixed, uh, get it fixed so other people don't have to share in it and um, feel free to use it in whatever way you want. Um, so um, I got time for one last question that just popped up here. Uh, so what are you seeing regarding labor rates versus a traditional 10 hour day versus going to an eight hour day? That's a fantastic question. Um, I'm having more and more discussions with clients. A matter of fact, two other clients this week, we discussed going to an eight hour day um, to get more in line, not just with California's SB5 mandate, just the fact that that's the way that labor actually works. Um, and customers understand that this 10 hour day is something that we made up because we were really bad at math back in the 80s. Um, so <laughs> there's no reason to not consider going to an eight hour day because it is reflective of the costs that you're incurring and charging overtime after eight hours, which is also reflective of most of the costs you're, you're incurring. So it's certainly worth talking about. Thank you for that question. So again, thank everybody for being here. Um, I hope you got something out of this. If you've got more questions, just shoot me an email. Uh, if you're a regular client, we'll just talk about it on your next call. And um, and uh, uh, have fun with this because there's some great insights here that are going to help you make more money, be more consistent about making money, and make better decisions about what's the next job that you want to take or maybe you don't want to take. Thanks, everybody. It's been good having you.